Greetings to you all in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So my name is Sukhris Tanamalas and I'll be on the Nalit. Uh, just as Brother Manas said, uh, said that there'll be something for the fathers or others as well. I would want to just take time to wish all of us a happy Mother's Day <laughs> in a different way that every one of us have moms and we cherish and uh, we truly are always grateful, especially for their lives, their sacrifice, their love that they poured in into our lives. Uh, I, I usually, I enjoy to. This is a new mic, and this is not supposed to do this. <laughs> anyway. um, yeah, the reason I'm wishing everybody is that every one of us have moms, and none of us would deny uh, that they. Have they haven't been loved, at least by their mom, if not by their dads. And uh, so we are always uh, to be grateful for our moms. And uh, it's a day where we celebrate God's goodness in our lives for the moms that he had given us. And especially to the sisters and the moms that are here, I would want to uh, praise God. And uh, truly, the privilege God had given you, uh, the honor of being a mom, I think it's, it's a special thing. And uh, certainly, I, I really uh, thank God for each of you and uh, uh, wish you a special, a special day for today. So uh, as we go into God's Word, uh, I'm going to have us pray. Uh, I'm going to especially pray for my translator. He's going to have a tough time because I have a lot to do <laughs> in the time that I have. And I'm, I'm going to see how uh, Vijay can catch up. Thank God for him. And uh, we're going to thank the Lord for this new mic God has given us and ask the Lord to uh, be dedicated for uh, its, it to be used for His glory. And I also would pray for all of us as we prepare to hear God's word. Let's pray, close our eyes and uh, look to the Lord for the word that He has. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this special day you've given us. Lord, uh, also this Lord's day, to worship you for who you are in our lives and to be ministered by you by the living word that you bring to us because you are alive and right here and thrown on our praises ready to minister to the hearts that seek to hear your word and uh, Lord uh, be blessed Father we desire to hear you and not a man unworthy as I am as I stand on thy behalf I ask Lord, Lord uh, that you would hide me behind thy cross and Lord, through me, to each one of us, Lord, that you would speak your word, that you would speak life, Lord, that you would speak uh, truth, so much so, Lord, that these words would become our very portions, dear Father. Especially, Lord, this time I thank you for uh, all the moms that you've given in our lives, through whom we could taste your love in a wonderful way, be, care be cared and uh, Lord, the nurtured and taken care of. I ask for your special blessing upon them. I also pray, Lord, that this time for uh, uh, and ask you a blessing upon this new mic head, uh, headset that you have given. Ask, Lord, that you would dedicate uh, it would be dedicated for your glory and for your kingdom that it would be used mightily. We also, Lord, thank you for the translation system. I also pray for the Vijay as he translates. May you be glorified and. Uh, May nothing be lost in this translation as well. Thank you and praise you for this wonderful time you're giving us. Cause us, Lord, to see you exalted, glorified, and Lord, that we would uh, love you and we would walk in your ways that you teach us today. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. All right, I also have a, a tough topic to deliver, uh, and that is... Uh, because of some questions that I'll be asking, which would probably make uh, some of us here uncomfortable. Uh, primarily because of the answers, if we were to give them in all honesty. Now, uh, if you have noticed the flyer, uh, the title of uh, our Mother's Day was taken from a portion called uh, Proverbs chapter 31. Um, and I want to begin with an introduction that uh, a man of God by name Cameron J. Bryant, he wrote in his article, um, as he lives in or uh, Oregon, Portland, he says that uh, 
in this article, he begins by saying, I hate Proverbs 31. This was said by a missionary colleague of, of his. Now, this was a woman, by the way, not a man. <laughs> this was a woman who loved God and loved her family. She was dedicated to serving her husband, training her children, devoted herself to what many would call traditional family values. This is a God-fearing woman, but she was casually talking, not in a serious way, but she says, I, to be honest, uh, she, she said she, is to, she hates Proverbs 31. That kind of gives a clue. Actually, she says, in, in a moment of frustration, she went saying the resentment towards the woman that is found in Proverbs 31. By the way, in Proverbs 31, you have two major sections, if you have never read Proverbs 31. The first nine verses, it focuses upon a mother's counsel to a prince by name Lemuel. The prince, Lemuel, he captures the counsel that he receives from a godly woman, which is her mother, which is his mother. And then from verses 10 onwards, till verse 31, the last verse in, uh, in chapter, Pro chapter 31, Proverbs, till the 31st verse, we see the rest of the portion of this chapter is focused upon virtuous woman, or you could take it as a, an excellent wife, or uh, it is a portrait of a godly woman, or a godly, uh, uh, godly wife. Now, when we take a look at the scripture, uh, that is why when uh, uh, this missionary woman, uh, as she reads Proverbs 31 verses 10 to verse 31, she always is too challenged. In fact, she can't keep up to the standards that this woman sets. And that's why she was a bit more frustrated in a godly way, not in, a, in another way. She was wanting to uh, be to the mark that the word of God demands for a God-fearing woman. Now, that might kind of give you a clue as to why she was in frustration saying that I hate Proverbs 31. Now, when you take up this chapter, uh, the, the man of God I told about from whom I'm borrowing some of the introduction is, is says that a Christian young, young man's dream is getting to when he reads Proverbs 31, he desires to get a Proverbs 31 wife itself. Now, uh, uh, there is a, uh, now when you go into reality, how many of us uh, would acknowledge that our dreams have come true now? That's where uh, things get a little more uncomfortable. <laughs> what I'm saying is, the Christian man's dream is to receive a Proverbs 31 wife. Now, uh, I don't know how many sisters really again and again read Proverbs 31. They also might, uh, like the other sister, a missionary lady, might not want to read Proverbs 31 as often as she doesn't want. Uh, so my point is that this Proverbs 31 talks about a virtuous woman, probably an ideal, godly woman, a, an excellent wife. Now, uh, yes, to an extent, uh, the author goes on to think, uh, does she really exist? Is she just an ideal woman, a, a model that is set in the scriptures? Was she ever living? Was there anyone who could be called as the ideal, excellent wife that this Proverbs 31 talks about? So these are the uh, questions that the author in the article, he raises up and he then he goes on to answer. Uh, she cannot, however, be dismissed as a fictional person. I mean, just as a model uh, uh, that is set. But because God's word gives to us nothing that is impossible to attain, we ought to take it as an inspiration from God's word, just as Jesus spoke. Jesus, when he spoke, he said, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. In uh, Matthew 5, verse 48, we read this scripture. Matthew 5, 48, we read, be perfect. And then Peter, in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, he says, be holy, because I am holy. That is what God desires of us. Now, you might wonder, this 
sermon is going in a direction where it is a big uh, uh, load downloading of uh, some instructions and uh, strong teaching for women but I want you to be with me because it is going to be seen very clearly that it is relevant for all of us sitting here. All of us sitting here need to be taking note of what this woman's characteristics are because we'll quickly come to this point. Now Matthew Henry as in his commentary he says the description uh, that is given in Proverbs 31 should become an encouragement for a daily study for every woman who wants to be a godly woman. And he says that it is, it is to be desired so that they would become truly beloved, respected, useful and honorable. That's what uh, Matthew Henry uh, says in the beginning. Then he says this passage is to be applied to every individual. Now I'm going to come to why we can, we can take it onto every individual. Because uh, before I say that, let me say it, it can also be applied to the church of God which is described as a virtuous spouse unto Christ himself. The church of God is called to be the bride in, in making, bride in preparation. Now, if you go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, uh, we read a scripture there which says, I'm going to read it in English. I want somebody to read it in Telugu if you have. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. Paul, when he's talking to the Corinthian church, he says this, an important note to take as to what a church of God is, the church that we all are part of. And we all are individually as pre being prepared as a bride of Christ. So let's read 2 Corinthians 11 too. I'm going to read in English. Uh, probably somebody can read it in English. I'll read it in Telugu. Right. So Paul is talking to the Corinthians church and he says uh, that I am jealous over you with godly jealousy for I have espoused you to one husband. Or in another translation you see that that you have been betrothed bet or you have been engaged to Christ and you are being prepared as a bride for the marriage of the Lamb that is coming. So there we see that there is a betrothal. Each one of you here, each one of us are being betrothed to Christ, presented when we are being baptized. It is a ceremony of betrothal, it is a ceremony of engagement are with us to Christ and we are being prepared, being sanctified on a day-to-day -day basis to being presented as a bride worthy to be married in the great marriage of the Lamb that is to happen. Now in that context when you take, this virtuous woman can truly be the church of God or individually a believer in Christ who needs to be, who, who needs to be uh, followed or mimicked or uh, to be modeled in, in our day-to-day -day living. And in that sense, it is not just only for the women or sisters or uh, our wives or spouses, but it is indeed truly for all of us individually. Now, let me uh, ask one or two more questions and then we'll go into the, the meat of the sermon today. So uh, the question that I had is, how many of us think our mothers are virtuous women? So many, so little. <laughs> oh, I, 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 I didn't say our wives are virtuous women. Why are you so afraid? Actually, <laughs> I know you are afraid because the next question is going to be: How many of us think our spouses are virtuous? Now, let's see. How many of us think? <laughs> okay, those of you who raised are having are not going to be in trouble at home, but the rest of them will have some trouble at home. I, I really thought there will be more hands in the first question because all of us would lovingly say our mothers are virtuous women and uh, maybe not agreeing for our wives. But when we take a look at this scripture, uh, Proverbs 31 verses 10 to 31, it gives us the characteristics of virtuous women where 
all of us, whether we are mothers or whether we are wives or whether we are even men for that matter, we need to long for becoming virtuous in nature. Now, let's get to this point, this important definition as to what virtuous is all about. If you go to the dictionary definition of what virtuous is, it is being good, good natured, good natured. It is being blameless. It is being righteous. It is being upright. Now, that actually should ring a bell that we all should long to be blameless. We all should long to be good natured. We all should long to be righteous, upright. And so, when we take note of this, let's, let's now try to answer this question. How many of us think our spouses are virtuous? Alright, I've seen some sisters raising their hand. That really is good. Because I didn't say how many of us have our wives as virtuous. I said spouses, by the way. Which means that you have uh, either your husband or wife truly that you are acknowledging them to be virtuous. Indeed, uh, it's, 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 it's a good thing that we acknowledge because we all should be virtuous, not by our own virtuousness, not by our own righteousness, but by the righteousness that we receive from Christ, where we long to grow in it, where we long to grow in it. Now, let's get to, uh, actually, the Telugu words, the meaning of the Telugu words give us a good picture of what virtuous Virtuousness is. It, is. it is said in Telugu as Sadgunamu or Niti Mantudu Ani Rai So when we take note of this, we all need to long for growing in good naturedness. Now, who is good, by the way? Let's consider, we, we have answered many questions. Who truly is good according to the scriptures? We see in uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 12, we know that there is none that knoweth to do good. There is absolutely none that knoweth to do good. And uh, there is none righteous, no not one. The author, Apostle Paul goes on to say that. And then he moves on uh, in Romans chapter 7 verse 18, he says, There is absolutely nothing good that dwelleth in me. Romans chapter 7 verse 18. Uh, I want us to read this verse in English. Yes. Here we see, the Bible always gives to us the reality of who humanity is. It gives the exact description of human, human hearts and human lives. Now, uh, our lives. Now, the point is, many of us have this, uh, unfortunately, we have this feeling as to say, human beings are generally good, but only at times they are bad. At times they have some sins, at times they have some fault, uh, that they fall prey and do mistakes. But the problem is, the Bible gives to us the exact description. We are core, at the core of our hearts, we are sinful it seems. At the core of our hearts, we are desperately wicked. That's what the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9, let's not go there. But at the surface level, we might seem good, we might be acting good. And we might try to live good. We have good intentions, but it is not possible enough ourselves to be good, the good that God desires of us. And that's why when Jesus was encountered by a rich young ruler who came to flatter Jesus in Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, we see Jesus being questioned by this rich young ruler, Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, sorry. Matthew chapter 19 verse 16. Somebody can read it in English. I believe you're going to read it in Telugu. Behold, one came and said unto him, Master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Yes. Good master, what good thing should I do that I may have eternal life? This rich young ruler wanted to do something and uh, inherit eternal life. And to that Jesus answers and says, And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Manchi 
Samadhan which everyone chooses now. So when we think, we look at this, we understand there is no inherent goodness in us that can take us, accept, make us acceptable to God. And which is why we need to receive that goodness that comes from God. We see here that God is good. We see right from the creation as well. Our God, when He made all things, He said everything, it is good. And uh, in fact, we see that He is a good God. In, uh, in Psalms 145, we read that our God is good and He provides for us. Uh, and uh, we read in Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount as well, that there is no variableness. Or sh actually, in James chapter 1 verse 17, we read, there is no variableness or shadow of turning with Him. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights in whom there is no variableness or shadow of turning. Such is our God. And He is the source of all goodness. If you and I desire to be good, it is from Him that we need to receive that goodness. That nature to do good, that nature to be good is from Him. And we need to let God pour out His goodness into our heart, lavish His good nature into our heart so that we can live it out. Now, let me go quickly. And how does He do that? He does so when we confess our sin, when we acknowledge that we are not we are not righteous, we are not good by our own nature. And when we receive that forgiveness, when we receive that cleansing, when we receive that new heart, when we receive that Spirit of God who enables us to do good what in our own selves cannot. So that's why we see the fruit of the flavor of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, goodness and meekness. It is a fruit of the Spirit of God, not in of ourselves. Now let's go to the meat of the sermon today, which we will be taking a look at some Proverbs chapter 31. Uh, by the way, a, a good a man of God happened to summarize in Proverbs 31 verses 10 to 31, he gives every verse, he picks up a characteristics. There are about 21 characteristics that he picks of a virtuous woman. And uh, when we take a note of all those 21 characteristics, I'm sure we will be exhausted. We will, we will not be able to remember anything. But for the sake of time, what I did is, I have brought to us seven of the most important characteristics that we can take a look. And especially in comparison to the church that we are. And to individually, as a believer, you and I are to take note of these seven wondrous characteristics that we see in this virtuous woman uh, in Proverbs 31. Let's pick it up in, uh, in Proverbs chapter 31 verse 13. Can somebody read 31 verse 13? The first characteristics that we will pick. Yes, I'm going to read that in Telugu for us. Just we see as a Proverbs 31 uh, woman, this virtuous woman, it reminds us that we as those that have become betrothed to Christ, engaged to Christ as individual believers and as church, we are to be those that would work willingly, that would work willingly, not out of force. We are not called to live uh, the, the works. We are actually saved by grace and we are saved onto good works that Christ has already ordained us to do. Now in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 to 10 we read that God has not saved us by works but He is saving us onto good works that we are to do. Now if you and I have received the gift of salvation, the goodness that comes, the forgiveness that comes, the cleansing that comes from Christ Jesus, you and I cannot but have the works that would follow, the heart of willingness to do the works of God. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 9 and 10, actually verse 10. We've been made to, we've been saved to good works. And if you and I are not 
actually resulting, our lives are not resulting in good works, we need to examine our lives. And uh, I want us to take note that this woman in Proverbs 31 verse 13, she was working willingly. She was not working out of force or compulsion. Nobody is pushing her to work. And she was a woman who was giving herself to the work of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 58, we read Apostle Paul encouraging the church and each and every individual believer like you and me to always abound in the work of God. To always abound in the work of God. Now, uh, let's read that. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Yes, here we see that when we labor, when we work the works that God has already ordained, He's going to, He's going to truly be faithful and uh, he's going to will not will never have our labor go in vain because our God is going to bless when we are bound in the work of God. Well, let's move uh, to 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 2 where Peter exhorts the elders in the church of God saying that as you have been given the privilege to oversee the church of God, you and I are to do it willingly, not out of constraint. Not being constrained, but willingly we are to work. Just like the virtuous woman, we are to work willingly. Now let's move to the second characteristic that we see, which is in uh, Proverbs 31, verse uh, 16. She considered a field and buy a faith. In the fruit of her hands, she planted a vineyard. Yes. Let's see this second characteristic, which is she not only works willingly, but she invests wisely. You see, this woman is somebody who invests wisely. Now, what did she do? In verse 16, we, we read, she considered a field and buyeth it. By the way, did you read, she considered gold and buyeth it and makes a necklace for herself. Right? Did, did we read that or did we read, she considered a field and buyeth it. You know, when we see uh, she was wise enough to invest, not spend, invest. Now, we want, all of us need to be investors. And uh, when we take note of the field and also the vineyard, two things should come to our mind. Matthew chapter 13, verse, uh, Matthew chapter 13 and uh, verse 38 and John chapter 15 should remind us that the field is basically this world in which the kingdom of God is. John chapter 15 says, I am the true vine and ye are my branches. We see Christ being planted in this world and when you take a, a contrast of those two portions, Matthew 13, the, the parable of the sower, we see that the sower goes on to sow the seed which is the word of God. And as the word is being sowed, the wine, I mean, we see the wheat going to come up and uh, we see the vineyard is representation of Christ. And we see that she happened to seek for a field and buy it. She is investing in the kingdom. She is investing in things that would last for eternity. Not for the temporal time, not for the days of maybe uh, after a few days or a few years, but she is investing for things that would last and have eternal fruits. That is, souls that are to come to Christ that many who are perishing would be brought into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So, where is our investment? She is a model in reminding us as to where our investment should be. Now, uh, in Matthew chapter 6 verse 19, we see, Lay not treasure upon the earth, where moth and rust corrupt, where thieves break in and steal. But Matthew chapter 6 verse 20 says, Lay up treasure in heaven. You know, as godly people, we can lay up treasures in heaven right when we are here. That is when we invest in kingdom, when we invest in the saving of the souls, we invest in heavenly things. I'm not asking us to become poor, they give all the riches, but when we, wherever we use our money, we need to use wisely in uh, giving God the due priority and preeminence, even in our giving as well. So we see this woman models to us not only in the aspect of working willingly, but in the aspect of investing wisely. 
But let's move to the third uh, aspect of her life. In 31, 20th verse, we see that she gives generously. After she works willingly, after she invests wisely, she gives generously, it seems. Let's read uh, verse 20. Yes, she stretcheth out her hand to the poor and she reaches out her hands to the needy. We are, we, are, we are called to be mindful of the poor and the needy and we are called to give generously. We are called to give generously. And uh, if we take note in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, we see that Apostle Paul gives in a principle, a principle in the economy of God. A principle that works in the economy of God, which is, he says, who, who, he that spareth, sorry, he that soweth sparingly is going to reap sparingly. So if you are going to invest in the kingdom of God or give to God sparingly, the Bible says that we are going to reap sparingly, it seems. He that soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. Whoever sows richly, they're going to reap richly. So we are called to take this principle of God's <coughs> word that we see. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, we read, Let him give and be a cheerful giver. By the way, Apostle Paul was talking to Corinthian church about the needs of the church that is in Jerusalem who are poor and suffering. And uh, he was taking a love offering to the church at Jerusalem. And in that context, he had said this. Now, that actually gives to us that we need to take in this principle of sowing bountifully and reaping bountifully, being a cheerful giver than a, a somebody who keeps things for ourselves. So, in that context, he gives a promise. He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, he says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, that ye always have all sufficiency in all things, may abound in every good work. It is only when we give spirit, we give bountifully to the kingdom of God and to the people of God and to the poor and needy as, as, God, as God leads us, He is going to take care of every need of ours. That's what we see here. It's a wonderful principle that we see in the life of the virtuous woman. Now let's move to the next point which is in verse 21, Proverbs 31, verse 21. Apart from working willingly, apart from investing wisely, apart from giving generously, she is a lady who is prepared fearlessly. Let's read the Proverbs 31 verse 21. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scattered. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. You know, here we see a a fearless woman. When we take note of this, there are many things that we are always afraid of. We are afraid of any ill health that might come. We are afraid of what will happen to our kids. We are afraid of what is going to come tomorrow, how our jobs are going to be intact, how the market will be, whether uh, we'll have any, uh, promotions or not. Many things. And uh, when we take note of our sisters, there are small things that they get afraid of very easily. Cockroaches, lizards, <laughs> starting from <laughs> everything we see, spiders, the things that cause us to be afraid of. But she is a woman who is prepared fearlessly. You see, she is preparing herself that she need not be afraid. That's what we see here in 21. She's not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She does some necessary preparation for her future, in essence. She is taking care. Here, the context is with regards to the snow and she has the clothes that are needed to protect their family, her family, from the, from the bitter cold and snow that it brings. So, now when we take note, in all our lives, we need to do all our preparation and our prayers so that we don't let fear govern our living. We need to let faith govern our living and not fear itself. When faith is there, fear has, cannot be there. And that's why in uh, Proverbs, sorry, in Psalm 37 we read David praying that when he had prayed to God, God had given him faith and he drove all the fear away from his heart. 
often times there are things that we get so afraid of because we don't pray, we don't depend on God, we don't lean on God, we end up being afraid and letting fear govern our decisions, fear govern our things that we do rather than faith governing our lives. So here is a woman modeling to us as to how we need to be prepared fearlessly. So let's move to the last, uh, actually in this context we see in Philippians chapter 1 verse 14 that uh, the church and the, every individual like you and me are to grow in being bold for God. Especially in these last days, we, not, we need not fear for the works of the evil one but stand boldly for the truth. First uh, Philippians chapter 1 verse 14, Paul says, when he was bound in chains in the Roman prison, there were many who waxed bold to preach the gospel, to stand up for the truth. In these last days, we can easily become cowards and be fearful of the, of the evil and the darkness that is around and not stand up for the truth, not be bold. We are called to be preparing ourselves to be bold and standing up for God and uh, because we are standing on behalf of the Lion of the Judah, the tribe of the Judah. We are not just standing on behalf of the Lamb of God, but we are standing on the lamp behalf of the Lion of the tribe of Judah. The, the Bible says the righteous are as bold as lions, it seems. You and I are called to be bold in standing up for the truth. When it matters with regards to the, to the truth of God, to the principles of God's word, you and I cannot succumb to the pressures or compromise to the principles and to the policies of this world. Let's take a, 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 an application to our lives that we prepare ourselves to stand boldly and uh, stand fearlessly. In, in the fifth one, we're going, to three, we're going to see three more very quickly and then close for today. In Proverbs 20, 31, verse 22 and 24, we see that this lady, uh, the woman, uh, the virtuous woman, not only is working, um, working willingly, invests wisely, gives generously, prepares fearlessly, she is also clothed righteously. Let's read Proverbs 31 verse 22 and 24. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry, her clothing is silk and purple. Yes. She maketh fine linen and celery, and delivereth riddles unto the mountain. Yes. Here we see she is a woman who, clothed, who is clothed righteously. You and I as child of God are to be clothed with the robes of righteousness that Christ gives us. We cannot approach God with our own righteousness. The Bible says our righteousness is filthy rags before the presence of a holy God. And when we approach God, we are to come in clothing of the righteousness that comes from the cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ. And so here is a woman, she is modeling to us how we need to have our lives, our families get a righteous clothing, righteous clothing. Indeed, we see in uh, Psalm, Proverbs 31 verse 24, she maketh fine linen and selleth it. By the way, when you take, go back to the culture of uh, the Jewish culture, every woman who is getting married, she needs, to, she needs to grow in the skill of making her own sari items before she can get married. And she needs to clothe herself with that same sari so that she can present herself to the bridegroom. That's the culture that the Jewish people have. And uh, that's why we see here, she maketh fine linen. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 8, we read that she was a woman who prepares herself with fine linen. And, uh, and that fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. When we take a look at the grand scheme of uh, the marriage of the Lamb, the church of God and every believer like you and me are being presented as a bride to Christ and uh, when we are going to approach Christ, we can only approach with the garments of fine linen, which are but the righteous works of the saints. You and I are to live out the great, good, righteous uh, heart that God, Christ had given to us. We need to live out of that. We need to let the love of God flow from our lives and live it out. Not, it cannot be manufactured by ourselves but we are called to live it out. So we see that not only she is clothed righteously, she has the clothing of righteousness upon her family. And that's the way we should be. We need to earnestly pray for the salvation 
of our loved ones and that each of us are responsible for it. Now we see that she is a woman who is clothed righteously. Sixthly, we see she speaks wisely and kindly. Let's read Proverbs 31 verse 26. She openeth her mouth with wisdom and her tongue is the law of kindness. By the way, when we talk about wiseness, we always think uh, there's a cunningness to it, but that's not the kind of wiseness that she says. She has kindness apart from the wiseness. She's wise and also kind. That is the way we are called to be. James 3.13 says that we are to be wise and endured with knowledge among knowledge that we should shew out of good conversation the works with meekness of wisdom. We are to shew forth good conversation with works, with meekness of his work, the works with meekness of wisdom. So we are called to demonstrate. Uh, we see a number of places in Colossians and also uh, Colossians chapter 3 in Ephesians that our conversation should be like salt. Our conversation should be like salt it seems. It should be salty. It should be tasty. Where we give forth the reason for the hope that is in us. That is the kind and uh, uh, the, the defensive, apologetic conversation that we need to have. Where whenever we go forth to talking to people, we need to give forth the reason for the hope that is in us. And that's what this woman models for us. Now lastly, we read in Proverbs 31 verse 30, a, a great a statement there that uh, the author puts forth. By the way, uh, though we see that this whole uh, portion of Proverbs 31 has been written uh, primarily as uh, in the beginning of this chapter, we see that these are the words of King Lemuel. Uh, another probably, it was thought to be another name for Solomon himself. Uh, and his mother had taught him and she gives an instruction that she he is not supposed to give his strength to the woman and uh, he is not supposed to be falling prey to the lusts of the woman or to the drink of the wine and uh, forget the commandments of God. In that context, this instruction was given, the word of God puts to us, the con in that context, the word of God brings to us that we need, that the king needs to seek after a virtuous woman for a wife. And that is where we see the qualities that we have walked through listed. Now in that context, we see the last quality that we need to take forth is we are to be, we are to be godly. Uh, this woman in verse 30, chapter 31 Proverbs, we see a verse here like this. Favor is deceitful, beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord shall be praised. The women that fear the Lord shall be praised. She was modeling to us to live godly, to live a God-fearing life. And so when we take a look at that, we see these wonderful characteristics that we need to emulate as a child of God. And uh, we need to be that individual uh, believers who prepare ourselves for the bride, bridegroom who is to come. And uh, we are called, uh, let's read another verse in Titus chapter 2 verse 12 which gives to us the picture of being able to live a godly life. It is not natural for us to live a godly life. We are naturally tended to live an ungodly life. That's what Titus chapter 2 verse 12 teaches us. Let's read. Yes, we have taken a look at the scripture extensively in our Bible study where in our previous life, before coming to Christ, we, we tended to live ungodly. That, that is, we were running to sin. We were delighting in sin. Now we run away from sin, where we hate sin, in essence, that we, 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 we are uh, truly repentant or penitent of the sin that might rule or that might have anything to do with us. And so here we see teaching, the grace of God is going to teach us to deny ungodliness, having received the grace, a free gift of salvation, a reasonless love. When we take note of that word called grace, reasonless love, it truly portrays uh, the kind of love that the mother shows. There's no reason except 
that the mother should uh, should love the child, except that God had given that motherly love to her. Now, when we take note of that, that reasonless love of God would constrain us to live a godly life. It would teach us to deny ungodliness and worldliness, and would cause us to live a godly life in this present world, not some time later. In this present world, during these times, it's going to teach us to live a godly and a God-fearing life. And may it be so as we take note of the seven things I want to just quickly summarize for from this virtuous woman, we learn that she was willing to work. Actually, she was willing, she was working willingly, basically. The second one is she was investing wisely, she was giving generously, she was prepared fearlessly, she was clothed righteously, she was speaking wisely and kindly. And then the last one, she was living a godly life. And may that be so of each of us as we are being betrothed to Christ, that we would live a life godly. That uh, when, when we take note of this in that same verse, in uh, verse 31, Proverbs 31, verse 31, give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own words praise her in the gates. Now, the, the thing that I want to close is that every virtuous spouse is going to be, or every virtuous woman, uh, as, as, they are, as they desire to be like this, are going to be a virtuous or, or godly moms that we all have and so sort of delight. And all of us need to long to be growing up in these characteristic, characteristics that God has brought to us. And may it be so that as we see such characteristics, there are many characteristics that we have already seen in our godly parents that God has given, especially our moms. But we are called to strive to grow in this aspect of living godly lives in this dark world that we live in. Let's pray and ask the Lord for His blessing upon this word and uh, all that we have heard. Heavenly Father, thank you Lord for this time you've given us to consider the model of a virtuous woman that you have set in thy word. We thank you Lord for the characteristics that we could reflect and uh, consider for our own lives, each of us individually. Yes, Lord, there is nothing good that dwells in us, in our flesh, but you who are the source of all goodness. Lord, when you draw us unto yourself, when you forgive us of our sins, when you clothe us with your goodness and righteousness. Indeed, Lord, we are given the Spirit of God as a gift whose flavor is goodness that would come out of us evidently, dear Father. Father, we desire to grow in this virtuousness that you have put forth in thy word. Lord, help us to live a godly life in these last days. Help us, Lord, that we would work willingly, that we would be prepared fearlessly. Lord, that we would be giving generously, dear Father. Lord, that uh, we would truly speak wisely. And Lord, that we would be bold in our proclamation. Father, that we would be those that would uh, truly, Lord, uh, invest wisely in thy kingdom. Lord, that we would reap great rewards unto eternity. To this end, I ask for your blessing upon each and every individual here. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name.